Welcome to a McKenzie Institute Long Talk. John Burroughs has been working with the Atlantic Salmon Federation for 20 years, so he's obviously on the side of the fish, but he also has a lot of experience with dams, big and small, so that's why I tracked him down in Brunswick, Maine. Hello. Hi, Alan. Now, we often think of dams, by we, I mean people who don't think about dams a lot, but we, we often think of dams as the thing that helped fuel 20th century and even 19th century progress, uh, turning a grits mill and uh, maybe even stocking them with fish. Um, but we've turned around that in, in about the past 75 years that dams have a finite life. They may have outlived some of their usefulness. Uh, they do deteriorate. So tell me your perspective on that. No, thank you. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there's been a great recognition, particularly I'd say over the last, you know, 25 to 30 years in particular, that dams, while they have a lot of benefits historically and currently in terms of um, renewable power generation, um, jobs and other stuff, there's actually a, a very negative side to dams. Um, and that's actually, that recognition, you know, if you look at historical records actually goes way back. If we go back to colonial times when the first dams in North America were, were constructed, um, there was recognition at that time from native peoples as well as a number of colonists that building dams interrupted these great spring fish migrations that we saw. Um, oftentimes though, it was the, the dams, the dam owners, whether it was for mills, for timber, textiles, um, grist mills and the like, they would win out. And over time, as we got better at building dams, we saw many, many more being constructed, not just on our tributaries, but on the main stems of our rivers. It got to the point that by the mid 1800s, every large river up, up and down the Eastern seaboard, you know, in the US and Canada was dammed up. Um, some watersheds had hundreds and hundreds of dams, all serving some form of economic purpose. I'd say over the past you know, generation or so, um, a lot of those dams were kind of modified maybe 100 years ago to produce hydropower. And a lot of these dams were not rebuilt really in any way. They weren't very efficient. And as modern environmental laws have come into effect, requiring things like fish passage or mitigation for impacts on habitat, on water quality, it's become, become clear that to kind of meet these modern standards that we all expect, that a lot of the dams out there on the landscape simply don't make any sense economically when you account for the true costs in terms of the environment, social impacts, and everything else. Well, now, just before we get to that, uh, you mentioned that there was some skepticism very early on in so-called settler times uh, about the damage to fish, but I thought fish ladders and fishways and other fish things uh, allowed fish to coexist with dams fairly well. Am I wrong? Uh, you're, you're wrong and right. Um, a lot of it depends on the species of, of fish that you're talking about. And also, it really matters about how many dams there are in a given watershed. Some species like Atlantic salmon or, or elwives, which on um, the Canadian side of the border are referred to as Gaspero, they are fairly adept at handling a few dam passages. Other species like sturgeon, rainbow smelt, um, some other fish species, um, just aren't very good at passing dams, no matter how good the fish passage. So what we find is that each species is has its own abilities and can maneuver past maybe one fish way or a couple of fish ways, but you start to have a lot of dams on your rivers and the cumulative impacts from each dam adds up. And so you, you only have a finite number of dams that can coexist with these fish species. Well, and so... You know and, and all of us, all of us about my age who watched old Walt Disney documentaries, remember salmon fishing, up, uh, swimming upstream and leaping feet into the air. But I guess if there are three or four dams in the way, they get tired. No, absolutely. And the, the thing too with, with fishways, um, even the best designed fishway that can pass a lot of those species is going to have problems. Um, they're never going to be 100% effective or efficient. In some years when you have high flows in the springtime, you have periods of time when these fish have very 
discrete windows when they need to get upstream to spawn, that if you have high flows or the fishway is broken down, you might miss some or almost all of that migration period and these fish will then turn around and leave. And when you add that up over the multiple dams and multiple species, it's become widely recognized that you really can't have self-sustaining runs of a lot of these fish over you know, one or two, maybe three dams at best on our rivers, even with great fishways. Um, so that's where the, the, the need to kind of balance you know, the, the really productive hydropower dams with the ones that are not at all efficient and you have greater benefits from fisheries, from recreation and other values, um, is kind of driving that, that rebalancing on our rivers that we're seeing in Maine and across the US and parts of Canada. Well, in, in a way, you're both ahead of me and you're leading into someone I love quoting, and that is ecologist uh, Barry Commoner, who said there's no such thing as a free lunch. I mean, the fish have some <laughs> rights and the people have some rights and the people need electrification and on and on the trade-offs go. But I think what I'm hearing these days is that these little run of the river dams that I thought were the most environmentally friendly thing you could imagine. You could stick a turbine into the water and just let the water flow. But even those uh, don't produce a lot of electricity, but they do have the negative effects. Can you talk about how much electricity we're losing if we uh, reopen the river? Sure. Well, on the on the St. Croix River, you know, the Milltown Dam is only have has a capacity of about four megawatts. Um, it's less than one percent of the power portfolio within New Brunswick, from New Brunswick Power for the province of New Brunswick. Uh, that can easily be replaced by increasing uh, power generation in other dams in the province, or, um, which is increasingly the case, doing solar power, doing wind turbines, doing other things. Um, solar in particular over the past decade has really taken off, has become very cost competitive with, with hydropower and does not have the impacts on the environment that, that these dams do. Um, but you're right, typically a, run, a small run of river dam with a good fish passage is one of the things that we prefer the most and what we would like to have on our rivers. Um, the problem is in the Northeast, we have a lot of these dams very low in the watershed and many of them have very poor fish passage or some of them don't even have fish passage at all. And so oftentimes it's these smaller dams that have a much larger impact because they're blocking access to, to entire watersheds. And we have a lot of those types of dams that are out there that are generating a few hundred kilowatts, maybe a, meg maybe a megawatt of electricity, um, but are having huge impacts versus there are large, some very large storage dams, you know, way up river um, that are generating the vast amount of hydropower, um, at least here in Maine. And, they are far above the range of most of these of most of these fish species, and those dams, even though they're not run of river, they provide other benefits for whitewater recreation and paddling and other things. And you can have just small tweaks at, at some of those dams in terms of more efficient turbines to make up for a bunch of these smaller dams coming out and regaining, you know, access to a whole lot of habitat for a whole bunch of different fish, fish species. Most organizations, and frankly, most people, look at uh, you know cash in hand, money in the pocket, uh, debt on the credit card, and they do their own little calculation. But none of us are very sophisticated in what's called full life cycle economic cost of something. Uh, cradle to grave stewardship is a term that's used. I think in Germany, if you're going to make something, including a car, you have to have a plan to recycle all the materials in that car. So have you really taken a look at uh, not only the loss of those kilowatt hours, which are small, I grant you, but the cost of decommissioning uh, the dam, uh, opening up the river, and then the benefit or potential benefit of tourism, of fish, of wildlife, recreation, um, have you looked at look at looked at that like in a really sophisticated and, and complete fashion? Yeah, that's that's a great point. I think uh, that's an area where kind of the economics is hasn't really caught up yet. And there's a lot of work which is about to ha about to begin here in Maine, kind of looking at some of those things, looking at um, some of the long term benefits from some dam removals that happened, you know, ten or twenty years ago, to actually look at what the costs were, the loss of hydropower, but then looking at the benefits 
that accrued from water quality improvements, fisheries and wildlife, um, recreation, looking at property values along, along former impoundments. Um, we tend to have, on the St. Croix, we've got a pretty good understanding of what the, the increase in fish, particularly with Gasparo, would be um, by opening up the river. We're talking about a run that could exceed 20 million fish, which would be far and away the largest run in North America. And that many fish would produce tens and tens of billions of juveniles, which would then feed pretty much everything in the freshwater down to the estuary, out into Passamaquoddy Bay in the Gulf of Maine, um, that whole big region. And these fish, the Gasparo, are really a keystone ecological species that feeds a lot of our commercial fish species in the Gulf, um, a lot of valuable um, species like whales, porpoises, um, kind of a, a, everything that's out there that either has a commercial fishery aspect or important recreational fish species or other species that we really care about um, with whales and everything else. And so oh, get, creating a run that big is going to have huge trickle down effects in terms of recreational fisheries and commercial fisheries. And then also there's the commercial harvest of those fish, which is really important for local folks, um, both um, local folks within the First Nation, but also commercial lobstermen um, everywhere have a shortage of bait. And Gasparo are one of the most preferred baits in the lobster industry. So we have the, the ability to create you know, a self-sustaining, very large source of local bait instead of bait being shipped in from halfway around the world, um, which it is currently being done. Well, uh, John Burroughs, uh, 20 years with the Atlantic Salmon Federation. Um, I was just going to bring up the so-called whale in the room when uh, you brought it up. There's a British academic whose name I forget who said, I'd rather have a really good guess about something that's going to happen than the definitive statistic on something that won't. So let me take a guess and see what you think of it. Both New Brunswick and Newfoundland have used the whale as a symbol in their tourism campaigns, and whale watching is a thing from land and also on boats. So if these fish are going to feed whales, my guess is that could either sustain or support more tourism. What's your view? No, I, I think that's the case. And this, these are things that, you know, don't happen overnight. And so I think we're looking you know, many decades down the line to have these ecosystem impacts. And so when you are feeding things, these kind of large charismatic species, some of which are actually, you know, endangered or, or threatened, um, you know, you really are benefiting, you know, those species, but also having those secondary impacts for tourism, ecotourism and the like. Um, in addition, when you have that many fish, when you can attract things like tuna, um, ground fish like haddock and cod, which feed on these fish, as well as striped bass and bluefish, you are supporting, you know, really vibrant recreational fisheries um, in the near coast environment. Um, and historically, when we had, before our rivers were dammed or before they were completely dammed, we had a lot of populations of ground fish that would come in to the near shore environment in the summertime when LYs were leaving. And you could, you know, hand line cod and haddock up and down the coast of Maine during that time. And that just doesn't exist anymore. And that's really tied directly to the loss of all this biomass that our, our rivers and lakes used to produce. And so that's really what we're trying to, trying to bring back is um, a bit of that history of that ecology that existed three and 400 years ago when we talked about our rivers being silver with fish in the springtime. Um, they literally were. And places where we've removed dams on rivers, you know, across the Northeast and particularly here in Maine, we've really seen a resurgence in these sea run fish populations. And our, our, we have places where people are going now um, where the fish hold up or where there's a small dam on a tributary with a fishway. And you can actually see these river herring in the tens or hundreds of thousands, which is something that 20, 30 years ago, you could not find anywhere in Maine. So there's a tourism industry in the springtime growing, just built around going in looking at these fish, which is, and then the wildlife that's feeding on them at the same time. It's funny what comes to mind in the middle of a conversation like this, but I honeymooned in Newfoundland 
and never will forget jigging for cod. And that is, I don't know if you've done it, but putting a great big hook in the ground and just pulling <laughs> it straight up. And there are so many cod, you get you get one. And yeah. I can't imagine having a fond memory of honeymooning and going looking at a dam. Although <laughs> I did I did enjoy looking at the uh, the Hoover Dam uh, when I was in uh, the, the Western US. Um, let's move on to something else, and I just want to see if you've encountered these issues. I didn't realize that dams are also potentially dangerous. There have been dam failures. There have been, I'm guessing, hundreds of people killed. Uh, 80% of your dams in America were built in the 18th century, and several thousand are considered unstable. Many of the earthen ones would simply have uh, garbage and vegetable matter and debris in them. Uh, what, do you, what do you know about the safety of dams in general? Yeah, um, in general, I know that every year the American Society of Civil Engineers puts out a dam safety report card, and I think that the U.S. as a whole either fails or gets a D minus every year for, for our dam safety programs. We do have tens of thousands of dams across the landscape, and depending on which jurisdiction you're in, um, there is a lot of variability in terms of how often they're inspected, um, what requirements there are to own, or own a dam, maintain a dam. And so we have a lot of dams out there that aren't serving any real economic purpose um, and are literally crumbling. Um, some states have very robust programs in terms of main, you know, either annual or, semi, you know, or inspections every few years. You have to pay a fee to register your dam. And there's dam safety folks on staff who go out, inspect the dam and tell you what you need to do, and then you're required to actually make those improvements. Or they also offer the chance, if you don't want the liability of owning a dam, here's some assistance to help you remove it. Um, here in Maine, we actually have no laws on the book that require dam owners to maintain their dams. Um, so you can own a dam, and unless there's a requirement for a fishway because of endangered salmon or, or something else, um, Basically, the state had there's no there's nothing that's making you maintain that, and so there are a lot of dams out there that are literally falling apart. And unless it become an issue for like camp owners on a lake, where if that dam blew out, and then so the, suddenly they're looking at not having lakefront access anymore, um, then it could become an issue. But otherwise, there's really nothing out there. Um, to get at those dams. And so as a result, you know, we've got a couple thousand dams in Maine that, you know, most of which are fairly small, but they're just sitting on the landscape, impeding fish and wildlife and really doing nothing else. And there's really no opportunities to, to try to remedy that. Well, and uh, what we all should have done was stimulus money in 2008, or <laughs> the kind of stimulus money we're doing now uh, is a whole other interview. Uh, however, let me just say that since you've been on the job for about 20 years and I've been on it for about 20 minutes, uh, there must have been something I should have asked you that I didn't. So I'm going to give you the last question and answer. Oh, boy. Now, that's a tough one, turning, turning the tables around. Um, well, I guess I would say, I don't know if it's a question as much as, as something I, I've seen you know, during my career and um, over time is that Despite, I think, the growing kind of movement to you know, restore our rivers to, and to remove dams, I, I still believe or see that there's a lot of hesitancy out there in local communities when you talk about um, dam removal. And I think a lot of it goes back to the fact, a couple of things. One, in a lot of places we're talking about fisheries that are not very robust at this point in time. And we're talking about numbers that may have existed 150 or 200 or 300 years ago and trying to bring that back. And there's just no, in most places, there's no connection to what was lost. And then also what people have a connection to is the dam and the small mill pond that may have been there their entire lives. And they see, you know, have an intense emotional connection with that. And so I, I see one of the biggest issues is just that we need to tackle is those social issues and you know getting folks to understand that dams aren't forever you know they were built with a purpose and many of them have outlived their lives and trying to get folks to see things from a different perspective is 
is always difficult, um, particularly when they have such a strong attachment that to something that's probably been on the landscape or in their backyard or in their town for their whole lives or for going back many generations within their family. And we're trying to say, you know, try to think about this river flowing again, having a strong or vibrant fish run and what that could mean for not just your community, but in terms of the wildlife, in terms of some other economic gains. And for a lot of folks who have not been able to see a restored river and a restored run of fish, of fish that's a very hard thing to, to picture. Um, versus you can go out west, you know, Pacific Northwest, British Columbia, Alaska, and still see, or even you know, some parts of, of the Maritimes or Labrador, Newfoundland, and where we ha haven't lost these fish, you can see you know, good runs of salmon still or, or other things, but a lot of places we've, we've lost that and we don't really have a good sense of the magnitude of what, of what we've lost over time. And so I think that's a really huge challenge. And I think as more and more dams come out and we see the success and see that mother nature is incredibly, incredibly resilient and the rivers green up, they become beautiful very, very quickly. And then we see the ecological changes happen. It convinces a lot of people that's the right thing to do. But it, it's, it is slow, at least in terms of human timescales, in terms of the geologic time scales of our river, I think we've come a long ways in the past 25 years or so, but there's, there's still quite a ways to go. Well, I guess we um, need to think of the old swimming hole as the uh, whitewater rafting river or some right. other usage. Um, John Burroughs, thank you very much. Uh, good question and good answer, if I may say. Uh, next time you can interview me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we don't uh, roll credits here on YouTube, but uh, let me just uh, point out to everyone watching that the fantastic picture behind you, the uh, photo credit is John Burroughs. Good work. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, right. Alan. Talk to you again. Great. Thank you. Take care. Any views expressed here are not necessarily those of the McKenzie Institute, its speakers, sponsors, or supporters. But the Institute is dedicated to fostering public discussion, debate, and education about security matters. Google the McKenzie Institute to join the discussion. The McKenzie Institute is grateful to its sponsors and supporters. Some of our short pods and long talks are a result of the support of Heathbridge Capital Management Limited, The National Post, and Dundurn Publishing.